Okay, we are now <laughs> recorded. So uh, this is uh, the last uh, the last talk for today. Uh, it's about creative AI, and uh, this is an hour and a half trip through dogs, Monet, and antennas. Uh, I'm uh, sorry. I'm Gabriele Graffietti. Uh, just some words about me. I'm a PhD student in the University of Bologna here in Italy, uh, which is the oldest university in the world. So it's uh, kind of a historical place. I'm the head of AI research at AI for People. And uh, yeah, I, 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 I am a member of some other association in, uh, in Bologna and uh, the world. <laughs> and, but uh, um, I am also an amateur astronomer here in my hometown in Cesena. And I'm a really, I really enjoy astronomy and all the space related stuff. So uh, it's one of the, Thing they enjoy the most. Uh, this is the outline for the today talk. So uh, we start uh, asking ourselves what is creativity. Uh, so and after that we have three main section about dogs, Monet and antennas. Uh, in the first section we talk about dogs or what a neural network dreams when it sleeps and how to teach it to paint, to paint some portraits. Uh, in the third section is about Monet uh, or generative model of the rescue and how to teach a neural network to paint better and with his own style. And the fourth section is uh, using artificial intelligence to create things thing that we cannot think of. Uh, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the end of each section, uh, there, is a, um, there, there is some time for question and answer. So if you have any question, please write in the chat. And uh, at the end of each section, I, I go to the, to the chat, I, I read all your questions, and I try to answer uh, in the best manner. Uh, there is also some code. Uh, I did not include in the outline because I'm not sure that uh, I have enough time to um, also show you, show you some, uh, some code. Uh, but uh, I hope so. And uh, at the end, we, we have some code, we have some. Uh, uh, exercises on uh, how to stylize our photo in, uh, in the style of a, of a, of a painting that uh, we like. So uh, hope to be quick and to, um, to be able to also show you some code. Uh, so let's start with this creativity. Uh, I'm not, I am a scientist. I have a scientific background, so I am not a philosopher. I cannot answer the question in a philosophical or sociological way. Uh, so I go to the Cambridge Dictionary, and uh, the, the definition of creativity is the ability to, to produce something original and unusual ideas, or to make something new or imaginative. Uh, for me, there are four keywords here. The first one is produce. So to be creative, I have to produce something, uh, which can be um, both both uh, uh, tangible or not tangible, like an algorithm or uh, a thing that is tangible, like, I don't know, a painting or uh, a chair. Have to be original. So the, the same thing has, has not to be invented before or uh, it's something new. Have to be unusual. So uh, this is uh, kind of the same of original, but at the same time different for me. And make something new is important. Uh, some examples of creativity are, for example, paintings, are, uh, for example, poetry, are, uh, for example, design. This is some highly designed chair, <laughs> very, very cool. Uh, another, another example of creativity is, for example, medicine. This is a uh, helicin, which is a uh, super antibiotics, which, is, uh, which was designed to combat uh, bacteria which uh, are antibiotic resistant. Uh, all of this stuff that I show you are not done by human or not created by human, but uh, these paintings are created by artificial intelligence, uh, by machine, by computers, and after that printed in a um, uh, in the in the same in the same tissue as as, as painting, but are created by computers. And uh, in this talk, we'll see how computer can be created this kind of uh, this kind of paintings. This poetry was created by a computer. It's not created by a human. It's created by, a, uh, by an, an artificial intelligence, by an algorithm that uh, uh, was designed to mimic the poetry of William Shakespeare. 
And one of the most interesting thing in this is this word here. This is twas that, uh, please, if there are some uh, native English speaker, correct me, but it's not a word that exists in the English dictionary. So it's not a real word. And it's uh, also not a word that was used by Shakespeare in any of his poetries. But it's a word that the neural network invented, but it was really, really similar to some word that Shakespeare used in this poetry. So it's a new word. It's a creative. It's a, a sort of the artificial intelligence created a new word, but it was similar or very similar to the same word used by Shakespeare. So it's a, uh, yeah, it's a, uh, it's cool. It's cool. It's just, uh, just the, the artificial intelligence think like Shakespeare. Uh, these, uh, these chairs, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I have this up here. Thank you. Uh, these chairs are designed by artificial intelligence. Uh, no human designed this chair, no human did this design, but it, this chair are uh, designed and rendered by an artificial intelligence uh, that is teach to how to design new things or to design uh, modern things, and these are the products. And this molecule, it, not the, yeah, it was designed by human. Uh, at the beginning, it was designed as a, as a drug for uh, diabetes. But it didn't work, so it was uh, forgotten by <laughs> by researcher. Uh, this this year, uh, an artificial intelligence algorithm that uh, um, was trained to predict the property of molecules, of physical molecules, of chemical uh, compounds, found that this molecule have some property, has some very very peculiar property that can uh, counteract a lot of antibiotic resistant bacteria. So it's a kind of super antibiotics and uh, some in vitro testing that uh, have been done this year show that uh, it's, it's a very, very powerful antibiotics, especially with a lot of bacteria that are, uh, have developed an antibiotic resistance. Uh, the properties of these molecules are not discovered by humans, but are discovered by this artificial intelligence, which have to be creative to discover this property because uh, this, uh, this molecule uh, that does, does not uh, act like a normal antibiotics, but there are some very, very complex chain of reaction that uh, this molecule triggers inside, inside and outside the, the cells uh, that no human have talked uh, of all these, um, all this, yeah, all this, all this reaction, sorry. Uh, but artificial intelligence uh, detected all this kind of reaction and say, yeah, this is a very good antibiotics. Uh, in my opinion, there are two types of uh, uh, creativity, uh, two types of, uh, yeah, AI creativity. The first type is AI, so artificial intelligence, used as a tool for creativity. So in this process, uh, all the creative process is controlled by human. Creativity resides in the human brain, and artificial intelligence is a simple tool, is used as a tool, like a paintbrush or, uh, like, like a, yeah, a paintbrush for a painter. It's, all, it's only a, a tool, the real creative process occurs in our brain. Uh, another kind of AI creativity is uh, AI, use AI as a real creative entity. Uh, so AI is really creative. So the product of AI are really creative. We, we, don't, have, we don't have control on the results. We don't have control on the process. We cannot predict what the AI will produce. Uh, and the creativity, yeah, resides in the artificial intelligence itself. Uh, this approach is more powerful, but less controllable in general. And uh, the first two sections uh, deal with the first approach. So we see uh, AI used as a tool for, creative, uh, um, for creativity. In the last section, uh, we see AI as a creative entity. And we see how to teach AI to be really creative and to produce something that uh, uh, we cannot think of. Yeah, so we we'll start with this. The first section it's about dogs. Uh, so, why about dogs? Well, first let's start our journey in 2012. Uh, that was arguably the turning point for AI machine learning uh, because uh, in 2012 it happened something uh, really, really important for all the artificial intelligence revolution and deep learning revolution that occurred the year before, and it's still. Uh, occurring today. 
for the first time, a uh, convolution neural network, so a deep neural network, a neural network, so something, uh, yeah, a neural network, a machine learning uh, deep model, uh, won the ImageNet challenge. This challenge was, uh, it's, really, re it's really, really tricky because it's composed of a million images of uh, object of a thousand classes. So for example, there are airplane, there are cats, dog, animals, etc. cetera. Uh, and, uh, uh, and the goal of the model is to uh, classify correctly uh, all, this kind, all these images in a correct class. Uh, why 2012 was the turning point? Because yeah, for the first time, a CNN was used to uh, resolve this task and uh, it uh, won by a large margin and most importantly, uh, improving the previous year result, result by more than 10 points, which is an astronomical uh, quantity in machine learning. Uh, sometimes later, these convolutional neural networks uh, were used for many v computer visual ta vision tasks, so classification, detection, et cetera, et cetera. There, are a great, there, there was a great hype around them, uh, especially in 240, 230, 2040, 2030, I'm sorry. And, uh, but yeah, scientists do science, so they start to ask why this convolution neural network are so good, why they learn, why they learn internally, why they are so good. Uh, etc. Uh, yeah, they started to look inside this model, and they found that uh, yeah, in the first layer, yeah, this model has, has our uh, layered model, so there are some layer of neurons here, and in the first layer, so for example here, the model learns some basic some basic feature of the images. So for example, it learns uh, uh, that there is a, a line here in, with this inclination, there is a line with the, this inclination here, there is a line here. So for example, this neuron here learns uh, to recognize all the lines or the contour of the object which has uh, this inclination. So for example, here, there is a contour of an object. We have this inclination, this neuron, it's uh, high, its response is high. Uh, as we go uh, further inside the network, all these features are summed together. So, uh, for example, in this layer here, I use this feature here and these and all the feature for the layer uh, before uh, to build some most interesting features. So, for example, I started to build some yeah some tires. This is a network, for example, to recognizing cars, uh, some part of cars here. So, for example, this neuron recognize this uh, uh, this tire, etc. And most importantly, in the last part of the network neurons started to recognize the entire object. For example, this neuron here uh, recognizes, for example, a car here. This neuron here is, act is active when uh, a car is in position in the image, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so uh, we, now we know that uh, how neural network works and how they learn internally. Uh, so scientists want to analyze the behavior of the network. Uh, so they simply choose a particular neuron, for example, associated with a significant pattern, and they wanted to maximize the response of the neuron, but not changing the network, but changing the input. So for example, if I want to, uh, to maximize this neuron here, for example, this neuron is, uh, is related to this pattern here. Uh, if I want to maximize the activation of this neuron without changing the network, in the image here, there, uh, have, have to contain uh, a car in, for example, in this, uh, um, with this uh, uh, shape and in this position, for example. Uh, so scientists, uh, what, what they want to do? Uh, in simple word, they ask the network to imagine which image maximize the chosen feature. So uh, I started with random noise. I changed the, I changed the image to, uh, acti to uh, activate at the maximum level this neuron. I, I expect that uh, in this image, sooner or later, it will, com it will uh, uh, converge to an image of a car. Uh, in more simpler words, they ask the network to imagine a car, a dog, or I don't know, a cat, etc. Uh, this it doesn't, uh, uh, it doesn't end up very well. The results are not really interesting uh, because without any realistic input, the network 
yeah, almost fail to imagine a realistic image. And we'll return on this task later to imagine something real. Uh, so the scientists have asked themselves, so yeah, what if a real image is used as a starting point and we ask the network to edit the starting image in order to maximize some internal feature? Yeah, in simpler words, this is uh, the same thing that we do when, we, for example, we watch in clouds and we see patterns. So, for example, I watch, uh, we watch in cloud and we see in, uh, faces or we see uh, animals, etc. And the same is the same. Um, um yeah the same task that for example our ancestors did when they see constellation in the in the stars so in the sky there are stars there are not constellations there are not people but yeah they kind of see people in the sky uh so for example we started from these images these are an image of some jellyfish and we want to for example maximize the neuron that recognize dog in this image uh, so we added the image to recognizing to we added the image to maximize the output of the neuron so we, we want to drive to uh, to draw sorry some dogs in this image so if we uh, do this procedure for um, for some uh, for some time we end up with something like this if we still doing this procedure for uh, many more um, it iteration we end up with something like this uh yeah i know that this is this is not really interesting this is uh, not uh, now it's yeah okay man it's, it's not really good but i assure you that back in 214 200 to 2000 sorry and 40 2015 this is really this was really really cool and uh, this is the first time that uh we can produce something artistic with neural networks. Uh, these are some details. So uh, stochastic gradient descent, so the same procedure used to uh, train the network is used not to train the network, but to edit the image. And the process, the process obviously is reiterated many times. And uh, there are some trivia here. Uh, one of, in my, in my opinion, one of the most uh, interesting thing is that images are similar to uh, hallucinogen induced hallucination uh, and this fact might suggest that uh, there is a functional resemblance between artificial neural network and particular layer of the visual cortex uh, so for me this is kind of cool and this is the first our first artistic usage of neural networks and artificial intelligence in general uh, other examples so for example if you tune the process or if you uh, yeah, if you tune the parameters, etc., we could uh, have some results that are more aesthetically appealing, like this one. Uh, yeah, I'm Italian, so this is a plate of pasta, of course. <laughs> uh, okay. So yeah, this is cool. This is the first uh, uh, usage of artificial intelligence to produce something creative. But uh, yeah, we are tired of dog. Uh, we want more control on the generated images. So. Uh, in this in this uh, in this algorithm which is called deep dream because it kind of uh, simulate uh, the dream the dreams of a neural network uh, we have no control over the results so we just maximize a neuron and the net the network is fixed we have no control uh, what we want is to produce images in a certain style uh, but maintaining the same context of the original image so for example we start with uh, uh my one of my photographs and i want to apply the style of the van gogh starry night for example uh yeah we have find a way to enforce our result results to have the content of one image for example uh we, we see we see the it later uh but the real important question here is what is style uh how we can teach a neural network style what is the style of a starry night of Van Gogh? What, what is the style of a Van Gogh paintings? What is the style in general? Uh, this was resolved in 2016 by uh, this very, very important paper by uh, Leon Gatis and uh, some other people. Uh, they use a pre-trained neural network. They use a VGG network. And they use it in two different ways. In one way, they uh extract the content of an image so 
uh, how I can extract the semantical content for so for example the uh, the object that are in the image so for example in this image there are houses in this image there are a, a, an house a dog uh, a person etc I could use the same um, the same concept that I use here for uh, the dream so for example uh, if uh, if I pass these images in the neural network, uh, this neuron, for example, is uh, activated. So it means that this feature here, for example, is, is somewhere in the image. If uh, I pass through the network another image and the same neuron is uh, highly activated, it means that the same feature, so the same object, object is present in the image. So this is a way to uh, force two images uh, and to verify that two images have the same object uh, inside. So uh yeah we have a way to uh enforce our result result to have the same content of our uh, target image but what is style uh for example here we have two images this is the uh, okay this is the uh, my content images so i want to stylize these images uh with this style of the this image here so this is the style image here and this is the content image uh, so I can use a pretrainian network to extract content in the same way that I showed you before. And I can also use the same network in a more clever manner to extract the style of this image here. Uh, we'll see it later how to extract the style of an image. Uh, but here there are some nice graphical explanation of uh, this process. So uh, if I pass this image here in the network, and I tried to reconstruct this image from the feature of yeah, some layer here, for example, for the feature of the first layer, I, I end up with a very, very nice result. So the image is almost the same. The same thing for style. Uh, I pass this image in the network here. I have some style representation. We'll later see uh, what we can uh, derive this style representation. And if I want to reconstruct the image, which is not the same image because there is there is not enforcing on the content, but also only on the style. This, for example, is uh, uh, what ends up in the first layer. And as uh, I moved on a uh, uh, more deep layer on the network, I, I end up with a more uh, general representation of the style of the image. Uh, in the first layer, I have more fine-grained representation. In the hidden layer, I have a more uh, general representation of the style. So how can I use these, uh, these two representation to uh, generate a new image with the content of my content image and the style of another image? Well, simply, I, uh, I use the same, I use a yeah, pretending network, so I don't have to train a network. Uh, I, use, uh, I have my content image here, so I pass through the network until, for example, the third layer, which is, which is the layer used in the paper. Uh, I calculate the content loss uh, against the gener a generated image, which is the image that I want to generate. And of course, this loss here and this uh, uh, activation here have to be the same or very, very similar. Because if the activation of the network uh, um, of the generated image and the activation of the network, the content image, if they are the same, it means that the same object are uh, inside the, the image. Uh, at the same time, I pass uh, through the same network, the style images. I, 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 yeah, I extract the style. We later see how, how we can extract the style. And uh, I compare the style of my style image with my generated image. So my generated image have to be the same content of my content image and the same style of my style image. And uh, I, don't, I do not change the network, I only change the image. The network is pre-trained. Uh, these are some details. I, oh, I have the code. So the code is, um, is about neural style transfer. It's about this, uh, uh, this algorithm here. I hope to finish on time to show you the code. Uh, so I'll skip these, these details and I'll return uh, on the details later uh, if I have time. Uh, for the code, because it's not really, really easy to understand how to extract the style from an image. Uh, these are some results of neural style transfer. So, for example, this is the content image. 
this is the style image and this is the result so you see that the contact the semantic content so uh the things in the image are the same but the style is different uh here another example and uh, in the last row there is another example again uh so this is yeah one our our, our first step towards some creative ai now uh, ai is used as a tool creativity is inside out so we choose the content images we choose the style images and ai is just a paintbrush it's just a tool so it's we are in the in the in the first uh, level of ai creativity that i showed you before uh, these are some other examples. So, for example, this is the Mona Lisa, stylized in uh, <laughs> in different uh, different styles, some Cubism, uh, Van Gogh, uh, or uh, Impressionism, or some other styles. And uh, mm. this is another cool application. So, uh, style cannot, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, style uh, mm, can be also extract by some photograph, not some from painting. So. For example, here I have a, a photograph of a lake. I want to apply the same style of this photograph. So a sunrise, uh, a lot of uh, reddish color, a lot of reddish skies, etc. And this is the result. So I have the same image here, but uh, with the style of this other photograph. And this is another example. I have a photo of, of, a, of a city. I want to apply the style of this other photo. And this is the result uh okay we finished the first section so if there are questions in the chat or if you have any question please uh about deep dream and neurostyle transfer please ask me now in the chat okay uh sorry i missed if the network in the middle is pretending as well yes uh do you mean in this slide here in this slide here, uh, the network is the same. It's just uh, reported for simplicity, but it's the same network. It's the same network. So the same network is used to extract style and used to extract uh, uh, content. So it's, uh, it's the same. Uh, your R slide available on GitHub with the code? Uh, no, not already, but uh, I, I promise that uh, I'll load the slide uh, after this, uh, this talk. So it will be available with the code, yeah, in the same folder. Okay, I didn't get if you, uh, if you need to have labels for the desire of comfort training, or if you combine super train network on the two different tasks. Uh, okay, uh, this is a good question. No, uh, you don't have to have labels. Uh, as I said before, uh, you, you have only one pre-trained network. Uh, so you pass an image in the network and you extract the you, you you pass the contact image on the network and you extract the contact information the content you pass the style image in the network and you extract the style information uh, you pass the generated image which at the at the beginning of the algorithm is uh made it's uh usually the the content images is this is a copy of the content images so you pass the image on the network uh you calculate the style uh information and the content information of the generated images you calculated the your, your loss so how much the content is different from the content image and how much the style is different from the style images and you adjust the generated images uh, to minimize these two losses uh is the network a C convolutional neural network yes is a vgg uh, 19 i think in the original paper so yeah, it's a convolutional neural network. And uh, I, I, I'm not really sure if it's a VGG 16 or a VGG 19, but uh, it's uh, for sure a VGG network. Uh, yeah, if you, if you want more information, of course, you can, uh, you can check this paper. It's a really, really nice lecture. Or you can check this, uh, this blog post on Medium, which is really, really good. Uh, if you want more more information, or hopefully we have the code for <laughs> for uh, for neural style transfer, and uh, we'll see it live at the at the end of the of the talk. Okay, so if there are if there aren't any other question, no. Okay, so okay, we could okay we could move to uh, the second section, which is Monet. 
This is an image of a portrait, uh, yeah, sorry, a painting of Monet. Uh, okay, there is another question, sorry. Uh, what are the adv advantages of it? Uh, I don't understand this question. Advantages of, uh, uh, yeah, comparing to, to what? I, 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 sorry, so, sorry, uh, Roshana, I, I, I didn't understand. I don't understand your question. So if you can uh, rephrase, I'll, uh, I'll answer it uh, later. Uh, but yeah, we have a Monet painting, but uh, yeah, this is not a really Monet painting because uh, uh, this is actually an image which is stylized, stylized as a Monet painting. Uh, okay. I, uh, I'll answer you uh, at the end of this section. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, uh, yeah, we see that in neurostyle transfer, we could apply here the style of uh, a single image to another image. So we have a content image, a style image, and we want to uh, teach, a, teach a network or produce something that has the same style. But what if, we, we just want to produce something that have the style of Van Gogh or have the style of Monet or have the style of uh, some other painter or have the style of uh, commercial advertising. I don't know. Uh, we here we are restricted to a single painting, a single style images. But what if, if we want to produce, uh, yeah, for example, the Mona Lisa uh, in a Kubis manner or with an uh, impressionist style? Uh, this is one of the limitations of neurostyle transfer. There are a uh, few more. So, for example, the main limitation in that is low uh, because uh, many forward and backward passes have to be uh, done uh, in order to edit the images, the image, the, our generated image. Uh, so, three images have to go uh, through the network. Uh, I have to backward the loss throughout all the network without modifying it. I have to modify an image, so it, it's kind of slow. Uh, as I said before, it's limited because uh, it can only copy a style of one single image, not the style of a painter or an artistic style. Can only be used for images, of course. And uh, here, the neural network is pre-trained. It, it, never, it never edited because the neural network here is just a tool to extract information about content and style. It, does not generate anything. We we modify the image, but the neural network does not generate anything. It's just a feature extractor. So the question is, how we can teach a neural network to generate Monet paintings, poetry, music, uh, etc. Here, there are generative models of the rescue. So what uh, what is a generative model? Uh, well, in machine learning, there are two kinds of model: discriminative model and generative model. Uh, the majority of models that uh, I think you have seen in your life are discriminative models. So, for example, if you want to classify something, if you want to detect uh, something, uh, etc., these are all discriminative models. They learn to discriminate between one or more classes here. They learn the boundaries. Generative models are more, in my opinion, more uh, advanced because they learn the distribution of the data here. So for example, they learn the distribution of red dots and they learn the distribution of uh, blue dots. And of course, if uh, I, have a I, have, I have learned the distribution, I could sample from the distribution and, for example, produce something new here. Uh, so generative model have this name because they naturally can generate new data. So, okay, but yeah, we have generative model. Why we don't teach them to yeah learn the... the the probability distribution of Monet paintings, so we can uh, uh, we can sample a new Monet painting that it was not painted by Monet. Uh, well, there are some problems here because uh, estimating a probability distribution uh, is almost impossible in high-dimensional spaces, and an image, which is, for example, a RGB images, so a colorful images of 256 pixels by 256, uh, has uh, almost to 100,000 dimensions. So it's a astronomically huge uh, space and it's impossible to 
sample from this page. Uh, some generative models uh, solve this problem, uh, not directly estimating the data probability, uh, but they learn only to generate data that is similar to the data, uh, the real data. So they do not, uh, they do not uh, learn any distribution. Uh, yeah, this last category of model is appealing, uh, but the real question is how can we estimate similarity between data? Uh, in other words, uh, how we can mathematically define the concept of how much a generated data is real. So how can I mathematically define uh, if, I, if my generated Monet paintings is real, it's, it's, sorry, it's similar to the real Monet paintings? Or how can I define if I generate, for example, here, I generated some image of cats uh, or images of, I don't know, Donald Trump or some other people? Well, yeah, there is no concept of uh, uh, similar to a cat or similar to a Van Gogh paintings. Uh, it's really, really uh, difficult to define it mathematically. Uh, but uh, we are very, very good in, uh, for example, seeing an image and uh, uh, and um, and tell without without even without thinking. Yeah, this is a cat. This is a Van Gogh, or this is a painting. This is Donald Trump, etc. Uh, why? But, well, because we have seen a lot of cats, a lot of uh, Van Gogh images, a lot of Trump images in our life, and our brain has modeled some sort of yeah statistical model that describes how, how a cat looks like. Yeah, the same is holds for Van Gogh, uh, Monet, and all all this all this all the uh, all the images that we we see in, in our life. Uh, yeah, but why we cannot use the same uh the same model to define um a mathematical model that you can use in a neural network yeah this is one of my answer uh because yeah neural network are trained alone we are in a society uh we have interaction with other people we have interaction with for example our parents we have interaction with uh, people things etc neural network are trained alone it's just closing a people a person in a room with an oracle that uh, uh, tell the tell the person this is true, this is false, etc. You basically didn't learn anything, in my opinion. Uh, in 2040, uh, a very very uh, surprising and breakthrough model uh, was developed by good, young good fellow, uh, and it's called generative adversarial network. Uh, why this model is so important? Uh, I, I'll try to uh, explain you uh, with a sort of really simple example. Uh, I'm Italian, <laughs> as you may know. Uh, so uh, before I have a plate of pasta and I still have with dogs. Now just to, uh, yeah, just, just to be more Italian, this is some wine. Uh, so how, how can it work? So, how we human interact with each other. So for example, um, a typical interaction is, so for example, I go, I, I want to buy some wine. Uh, I go to a wine shop, the shop, the shop owner uh, give me some wine, I pay it, and uh, I return home with some good wine. Uh, since wine is, uh, is expensive, good wine is expensive, uh, there are, there are, uh, yeah, some people uh, can think that, well, if, uh, if, uh, if I can do fake wine, so for example, if I can uh, produce fake wine, which is not wine, but it uh, resembles wine, it's very similar, the taste is the same, uh, and producing it cost me less more than the, um, the actual uh, price of the wine, I could, uh, um, I could sell this fake wine to you, you didn't recognize there is not wine, and uh, I can do a lot of money. So the objective in this some kind of yeah game, the objective of the forger is to produce some fake wine, but really, really similar uh, or almost identical to the real wine. And the goal of the customer is to discriminate or recognizing uh, which one is fake and which one is real wine. This is the, uh, yeah the kind of game, the real game that we played in our real life. 
so there is a forger, uh, there are some inspirations. So yeah, for example, if I put these substances uh, together, I can, uh, I can generate something that the taste is as wine, but it's not wine. And uh, I spend uh, uh, very, very few, a very few amount of money. I could uh, sell it for an astronomical amount of money because it's similar to a very, very expensive wine. And uh, there is Har, uh, uh, the, our customer, that uh, uh, they see and tasted some fake wine and tasted some real wine. And they have to tell the difference so they have to discriminate no no this is fake i don't want to buy it or this is real wine yeah okay i want to buy it this is the gun how, how generative of the trial network works and uh, you say you you see that uh, this kind of interaction interaction uh, leads to a network a neural network uh, that can produce something some data some images some sound, some uh, words, some poetry, some uh, articles, etc., that are really, really similar to the real ones. Because the goal of the generator here is to uh, um, uh, is to deceive the discriminator. So he learns to produce images. In this case, image of uh, numbers. There are really, really similar, almost. Uh, uh identical to the real images of uh, numbers for example or the real monet paintings or the real uh van gogh paintings or the real uh, work of art the goal of the discriminator here is uh, uh is to uh discriminate between what is real and what is not real if we uh let these two network play together so this is a sort of game uh, the generator want to beat the discriminator and the discriminator want to beat the generator uh, we end up with a really really good discriminator and we end up with a really 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 good generator uh, astronaut um, very very good so uh, better than any generative model that uh, have ever developed before uh, and the most important things here is that uh, the generator here do not do not see the training set so do not see the actual real images because if the generator can see the real images the task is trivial they just can copy the real images and its task is done but the generator uh, never sees the real images so they don't have any idea of the real data is uh, they only uh, produce something new uh, in order to uh, beat the discriminator in this game and in order to beat the discriminator they have to produce something that is really really similar to the real data without uh, knowing what the real data is uh yeah this is uh, uh the same thing that uh, i said to you before so the generator takes as input a noise vector so a random vector or a random uh, yeah a random images or a, a random sequence of number and the output uh, an image in this case or what, what, whatever you want uh, as an output uh, as similar as possible to real data uh, is an implicit generative model because it doesn't model the distribution of data and uh, is unsupervised the discriminator on the other end takes uh, as input real and fake data so only the discriminator sees the real data uh, and try and tries to discriminate between them this, the, the discriminator is supervised, so they know, uh, they know the labels of the data. And this is a discriminative model. Uh, so why guns are everywhere? Uh, there is, yeah, maybe not now, but a few years ago, there are a lot of hype about the generative of the style network. And there are used for many, many things. Uh, but why? Uh, this is why you don't need to design a loss function. You have the discriminator. The discriminator act as a loss function for the generator we don't have to define a loss function to yeah how much the image generated by the generator are similar to the real images of monet paintings no you, you don't have to define anything it's just a discriminator that acts as a loss function for the generator uh, these are some examples of images generated by uh, a generative other silent networks the first image on the on the left here is called uh, edmond de bellamy and uh, 
it was the first generated AE uh, piece of art that was uh, sell in an auction in uh, late uh, 2018. And uh, it was sold for uh, almost for $400,000, more than $400,000. And if you look closer here, the, uh, the, the signature of the, of the artist is not a, a, a real signature, so it's not the, the signature of a real person, but is the loss function, is the mathematical function that define uh, a generative adversarial network. Uh, these two here are uh, two works by Mario Klingerman, which is a, a German, I think, German artist that uh, uh, it worked with this kind of model. So it produced a piece of art using uh, generative adversarial networks, uh, using uh, um, machine learning and artificial intelligence. And uh, many, of, many of his uh, works are exposed in the most pre prestigious galleries in the world. So it's something real. Art is now generated by artificial intelligence. Uh, artificial intelligence generates art, uh, which is exposed in gallery. And I'm not an art expert, but uh, for example, if I if I saw in an art gallery these uh, these paintings here, uh, I cannot uh, I cannot see if uh, um, yeah I, I've never uh, I never said that this was generated by an artificial intelligence or by a generative adversarial network. For me, it's just a modern art generated by an artist. Uh, OK, but uh, what if, if you want to uh, do something uh, mm, quite more, yeah, not difficult, but different? Uh, so we see that GAN can generate uh, images similar to uh, the images uh, on which it was trained. Uh, so for example, uh, this GAN here was trained to uh, paintings from the, I think, 70s, uh, 80s, and 90s century. So it generates a new painting similar to the paintings of the 18th century, for example. But what is if I want to control uh, the kind of, uh, um, yeah, I want to control the result, the output of the generative of the silent network. So for example, I want to transform uh, here a photograph with the style of Monet, Van Gogh, Cezanne, etc. Or I want to transform a Monet painting in a photograph. So uh, I want to I want to be able to see the same thing that Monet saw when he painted uh, this painting. Uh, I want to transform, for example, this is not artistic, but yeah, kind of. I want to transform, a, for example, a summer scene uh, in a winter scene. Uh, I want to do this kind of stuff, just not generating a, win a winter scene, just not generating a, um, uh, a painting similar to Van Gogh, etc. But I want to use my photograph and stylize it in the style of Van Gogh, not in the style of a single painting like in your style transfer, but in general with the style of an artist or with an artistic genre. Uh, this can be done with uh, not one gun, but two generative of the style network. And there are also models that use four at generative of the style network. So this model is called cycle gun. The model with four is bicycle, bicycle gun or bicycle gun. Uh, yeah, the, the, there are, uh, as I said before, there was a lot of hype with generative of the style network. So scientists uh, have become mad and they, um, they develop a lot of uh, different uh, models. But the idea of this model is really, is really, really simple. Uh, and it's based on the concept of uh, uh, cycle consistency, which is the same con con uh, the same con uh, sorry, the same uh, thing that we uh, apply when we want to translate between two languages. If I want to translate, for example, from Italian to English, a sentence, I have a sentence in Italia, I translate uh, uh, the sent it to English. If I do the opposite, so I take the uh, the translated sentence in English and I translate it back to Italian, uh, I have to um, yeah, the result has to be really really similar to the sentence and uh, um, to the starting sentence. Uh, using this concept of mapping, I use two different generative adversarial networks. So one that, uh, for example, maps from Monet to photograph. Another one that maps to photograph here to Monet paintings. 
and uh, in order to enforce the content of the of the image to be the same i use this cycle consistency law so for example i started with this is the original monet paintings i translate it to an image to a photograph i translate back the photograph to a monet painting and i uh, calculate the distance or the similarity or the difference between these two Monet paintings. One, the original, one, the generated passing from the photograph. Of course, more these two, um, these two paintings are similar, uh, more it means that the network has, uh, um, uh, has maintained the content of the image untouched. So the content is the same. Uh, yeah, th these are some examples. Uh, these are some other examples. Uh, artist loves this kind of technology. So, uh, for example, the Ma Mario Klingerman uh, did a portrait to doll face uh, um, model. Uh, th this is really, really. Oh, sorry. Uh, this is really, really interesting. So, this is. Uh, I think there are the links. Yeah. So, if you click on the slide, you have all the links for uh, all these um, all these applications. This is really, really interesting because it's resurrecting ancient cities. So uh, they, uh, this artist, Jack Clark, uh, take uh, the map of ancient cities. So for example, Babylon or uh, ancient Rome or uh, I, I don't know, ancient cities. Uh, and they translate it to uh, Google Earth photograph. So uh, we could see how uh, ancient cities um, Ha, uh, was as we can saw uh, it uh, on a satellite it's just they are real now uh, so it, for me it's a really really cool application uh, there is a lot of space to uh, creativity here we are um, uh, still in the re in the in the field of uh, we human are the creative tools these are uh, we human control the creativity flow uh, these model are just tools uh so and but they are very very powerful tools and uh, we can use them for a very very different task and a very very cool task uh yeah but there is a question here yeah gun are really really good at imitating real data so they can produce piece of art they can produce uh, poetry uh we, we only saw we only see uh images because are, are, are easier to work with the images, but they can also produce music, they can also produce uh, poetry, etc. Uh, that resemble real art produced by humans. Uh, for example, they can imitate pretty well the style of a painter, the genre of a music, uh, etc. But this is a, this is a important question for me. Yeah, this is creativity or imitation. So a generative adversarial network is just a very very good imitator. Or there is some creativity inside uh, because we want we want our generator our model to be really creative not just an imitator of real data uh, and this is what creative adversarial network or cans uh, do because uh, the discriminator not only discriminate between real and generated art but also discriminate uh, all the artworks into a style so for example yeah uh, an image is uh, is uh, passed through the discriminator it tells yeah for me this is real art and the genre is cubism or the genre is impressionism uh why this is really creative because if a generated image is classified as art so i generate an image the discriminator say yeah for me it's art it's, uh, it's real but uh, the same discriminator is not able to classify it in a known style so i don't know yeah it's real it's art for me it's art it's real but yeah i i, I don't know uh i don't know how to classify it in um in artistic style the generated image can be considered a new and a creative work because it cannot be classified in any known style uh that human uh, used to produce art these are some example of uh, uh of the result of this creative adversarial network uh i really really like for example this painting here uh and to be really really honest if uh, 
they show me these paintings in a in a museum of modern art and they tell me that yeah this is a really good artist a modern artist yeah i totally believe it i i i, I can't i can't really um tell you that uh, yeah, for example this painting here was generated by a machine it's it's, it's really really similar to uh the the modern painting generated by humans these are some other examples and uh, this is a really really interesting things because in the paper they uh they generated some images uh, they collect some uh, some people i think uh, uh, a pretty large amount of people i think 10 people for any images uh, and they ask the people some questions they do some tests and this is for me it's the most interesting because they ask for questions to the participants. So the first question is, as I interact with this painting, I start to see the artist's intentionality, so it looks like it was composed very intentionally or not. The second question is, as I interact with this painting, I start to see a structure emerging. The third question is, communication. As I interact with this painting, I feel that it's communicating with me, so it communicates something with me. And the fourth question is, is about inspiration. So as I interact with this painting, I feel inspired and elevated. And they ask uh, people this question when, uh, at the same time, they show people uh, some of these, some of real, yeah, for example, th they show me a real painting and I have to answer the question. They show me a generated painting without obviously telling me uh, which one is generated, which one is real. And they ask me this question. I have to answer with um, uh, with a number, so one, totally not. So, for example, in the question two, uh, I start to see a structure emerging. It's a, if I answer with one, totally not. Uh, to five, five, it, yes, totally. And uh, as we can see, the painting generated by this uh, creative adversarial network are generally uh, voted higher than the real painting for example from uh, abstract expressionism which is uh the style more similar to uh to the style uh generated by this uh, adversarial uh, network which is creative adversarial network painted from the art basel 2016 or painting from some artists set combined and uh, yeah so for example for, for me, the, the most interesting thing is that question four about inspiration. So as I interact with this painting, I feel inspired and elevated. Uh, the, the, the painting generated by, this, by, by, by a computer, by a machine learning algorithm, are uh, aver on average, uh, uh, both are on average considered more inspiring than real painting from real artists, from human artists. And if it's kind of, yeah, cool, but at the same time for me, kind of, yeah, it start to be some, it start to be scary. <laughs> I don't know what, what do you think? Okay, so we finished the second section. Uh, if there are some questions, I see there are five questions in the chat. Uh, so if you have any other question, please write down in the chat. Okay, the advantages of merging the images with style. Uh, well, there is no advantage. Well, uh, what 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 do you mean uh, with advantages? Uh, it's just to create something new. There is no uh, mm, an advantage. Uh, uh, yeah, in yeah. I, so sorry, I I I don't understand. What what do you mean by advantage? Okay. Yeah. So, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Okay. Uh, it can applicable to, to text data. Yes, uh, you can apply to text, uh, but uh, uh, for text data, uh, transformers that uh, if you follow the field course this morning, uh, I think uh, um, it showed you transformers or GP2, GP3 uh, works. Uh, uh, works better than uh, generative adversarial network, uh, mainly because the generative adversarial network does not deal well uh, with uh, uh, 
uh, not real data. Uh, so data which is not continuous. So text is not continuous. I have an A, I have a B. I, I, I cannot have something in between. Uh, and GANs, in general, uh, many of the neural network model does not really work work well with text. Uh, so yeah, of course you can uh, you can apply GAN to text, but maybe it's not the it's not the best sol solution. Uh, it's better to apply them on images and or music, for example. Uh, if you use a recurrent neural network, uh, training in adversarial set time settings so you you can generate new music and uh, there are many many works uh, in this field if you google the the internet uh, you you'll find uh, uh, some very good work uh, and uh, some music generate oh, generated by by this model yeah okay so there is another question so i start the last section of my talk which is about antennas and now we enter in the realm of artificial intelligence that is not only a tool for creativity, but it's really, crea it's really creative. Artificial intelligence becomes really creative. Uh, yeah, until now, we have seen creativity just in the art. So for example, we've seen how to uh, transform a picture in the style of a painter. Uh, we see how to generate uh, new paintings, how to generate music, for example. We, 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 we didn't see how to generate music, but we can generate music, poetry, etc. Uh, but creativity, it's obviously not limited to art. Uh, for example, in mathematics, science, there are a lot of creative people uh, that do not produce art, but they produce, for example, new theorem, uh, new theories, and uh, they solve uh, unresolved problems or they solve problems in a new creative way, in a different way, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, yeah, just to um, just to tell you a story, there is, for example, one of the biggest history of creativity. It happened in 1905, and uh, it's done by this man, which is Albert Einstein. Uh, because yeah, in 1905 there there is some uh, in the physics world, uh, there are, yeah, it's very, very tumultuous because uh, 17 years before, uh, Michelson and Morley demonstrated by accident, because they want to demonstrate the opposite things, that the speed of light is always constant. And this uh, break up uh, almost the uh, theories that uh, are known and are used uh, before uh, 1905. Uh, this is counterintuitive because uh, something that uh, has always the same speed uh, and if I measure the speed of light uh, is always the same uh, if, if I am uh, yeah it's the same uh, uh, if I am uh, uh, um, at rest is the same if I go in the same direction so it, it, it's really really counterintuitive and as time we solve this big problem uh, with the special theory of relativity in a very creative way. So yeah, the speed of light is constant. Okay. So if the speed of is if, uh, sorry, if the speed of light is constant, it means that the space and time are not constant. And this turned out to be true. But at the time and even uh, today, it's really, really counterintuitive to think that the time is not constant. So for example, the time I measure is different from the time another people in another planet or it, in another different place on Earth, measures. Uh, it's really, really counterintuitive. And uh, in my opinion, uh, it, uh, uh, Einstein was very, very creative in thinking that, yeah, time, which, which, which from the uh, ancient time, from the, from the start of the human history, I've always considered to be constant. The flow of time is always constant. So a year is a year, a day is a day, an hour is an hour. It really not constant, but it changes. So, uh, uh, yes, uh, yeah, uh, I have the code and uh, I share with you at the end of the lesson. Uh, so, yeah, another, another issue of creativity comes in 2006. Uh, 
NASA wants to launch a mission called Space Technology 5, or ST5, to study the Earth's magnetosphere. Uh, but there is a problem, because scientists struggle to design an effective antenna to communicate with the Earth. Uh, commonly, scientists use the quadrifilar helix antenna, which is the antenna in the image here. But with this mission, it did not work very well. Uh, so scientists struggle to design a new antenna, but they cannot, and uh, they di they didn't reach any good results. So they cannot uh, um, design an effective antenna for the mission. Uh, what scientists do? Yeah, they do. I think the hardest thing things for an engineer to do. So they asking for help. <laughs> I'm an engineer, so asking for help is really really difficult. And the solution was this. This antenna was designed not by humans, but was designed by artificial intelligence, by a uh, learning algorithm. Uh, yeah, by not learning algorithm. We'll see it uh, uh, soon. It's a genetic algorithm. Uh, so this design is not think by human. It's not so by human. It's not uh, designed by humans, but this counterintuitive design, because it's totally counterintuitive, I think no human in, uh, will ever be uh, will ever thought about this design. It, it's totally counterintuitive. It's not symmetrical. It, uh, it, it it seems random, but it worked really really good with this mission. It's the best antenna to use for the mission, uh, and it was designed by a, a computer by a, an algorithm. Uh, how we work this algorithm? It, as I said before, it's a genetic algorithm. And uh, uh, yeah, the behavior of the algorithm, it's, uh, yeah, back in 2006, yeah. M maybe before, because the mission was launched in 2006. Uh, maybe the, the designing of the antenna was 2005 or maybe, maybe earlier. Uh, so how it works a genetic algorithm? It starts from, yeah, it's really, it really easy, but it's con counterintuitive, I know, but it works. It starts from a random population. So, for example, I want to design an antenna. I start to, yeah, design, I don't know, a thousand antenna randomly, totally random. I test every single individual. Uh, for example, I simulate uh, the behavior of the antenna. I, I, obviously, I don't have to launch a thousand satellites to test all the antenna. I, Simulate. I don't. I don't even have to build all or all, all the antennas. I just simulate with a, a computer simulation. Uh, I select the top k percent of performing individuals. So uh, I don't know. The top fifty percent of the best performing individual are selected, and the other are discarded. The next generation of individuals is generated, combining the characteristic for two or more individuals of the top k percent of individuals. So, for example, if I have two antennas, one that it curved on the right, on the on the left, and another one is curved on the right, maybe it depends on the algorithm that I use to um, uh, to combine um, two individuals. But maybe uh, the resulting antenna is curved is will be curved on the center. Uh, I apply some random mutations in the population. I have the new population, so I. I uh, I go to to the um, to the to the second step and test again the indi all the individuals select the top k uh, discard the others combining the characteristic of these uh, new individuals apply some mutation test again uh, this is obviously counterintuitive the first time that uh, I uh, I saw this uh, uh, this algorithm and uh, uh, I try to do uh, some tests with genetic algorithm uh, yeah I, I was surprised because i i didn't know that uh, it will it will ever work uh, it's almost counterintuitive because yeah i just uh, select individuals i just combine in to combine them uh, in a random way and wow after some times uh, i have one or more individuals that perform really really well in the task uh, why this procedure is creative? One, we have no control on the evolution of population. 
uh, we don't know the best solution. Uh, so the solution can be very different for the one we think of. We don't have any control. Uh, we don't instill in the process human precon preconception. So for example, we human are really, really biased in a very, very different ways. So for example, we, uh, we, study, we study things, uh, we have common sense, uh, we have common beliefs that, yeah, uh, many times are right, but sometimes they can be not right or can be wrong or can be uh, uh, or can be uh, yeah just an obstacle for a really really uh, interesting new solution uh, and uh, usually really creative way of doing things emerge from this system because they have uh, as I said before they have no human preconception uh, we do not instill anything of our belief or, or of our bias in this system we the only thing that uh, we have to do is testing uh testing the individuals and find the top uh, uh the top most performing individuals so they don't instill anything they don't instill any loss uh, there is no data there is no real data uh there is no uh there is anything there is anything so usually uh they find a way that it's really really different for our way of doing the same thing the example is this antenna human usually designing antenna in a symmetrical way with uh, very very smooth uh, uh shapes etc but for this task this kind of random antenna is the best and i think no human uh, could ever design an antenna like this uh, this can be used to create some art it's called evolutionary art and it's one of my uh, favorite uh, things of doing art so for example this is an image evolved from random images uh, combined together in, uh, in a lot of generation as the human evolution uh, give us hands uh, to hands to arms to uh, legs etc uh, this evolution is simulated in a computer in a computer uh, to create for example this piece of art which is some abstract art and this art is not generated uh, in a way that yeah I want to um, to be similar to the real art the real human heart I want to be similar to a style I want to be similar to the art made by human no 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 there is no human preconception this is just computer be creative this is art generated by computer without human preconceptions. Uh, there is a large class of different problems that can be solved with evolutionary creativity. So, uh, for example, evolutionary system can, all, can also be used to produce piece of art, uh, painting, music, poetry. They are totally different for uh, the art that we produce, but yeah, we are human. We have some preconcepts, we have some bias. Why, why computer have to have uh our preconcepts and our constraints computers are different than human and uh, in my opinion they have to be a different uh, kind of uh, creativity uh, the most important thing is the field is very very rich there is space for new ideas there is space for approaches so if you are interested uh this paper i think there is a link yes so if you click uh, it here there is a link to this paper is a must read and this the surprising creativity of digital revolution a collection of anecdotes from evolutionary computation and artificial life research it's a very very good paper it's quite long but it's very very complete and uh, has a lot of very very interesting um, ideas there are a lot of interesting approaches uh, and as i said before it's a very rich field if you have ideas if you have new approaches if you want to try something feel free to try uh, it's a very open field one last example of digital creativity this is a real creativity uh, is this one uh, as I said before creativity can be defined as the ability to solve new problems or the ability to solve problems in a new and unexpected manner uh, in 2013 researcher uh, teach computer to play Atari games, NES games, 
uh, it was the rise of deep mind, the rise of uh, computers that beat humans up, uh, on Atari games, for example, pinball, for example, um, I don't know, uh, uh, Pac-Man, a lot of these old school games. Uh, one interesting creative behavior uh, was learned by the agent that played Tetris. Uh, Tetris, I, I don't know if any of you uh, has ever played Tetris or know Tetris. Uh, please write in the chat now if you don't know uh, what is Tetris. I, you have five, four, three. Okay, so any of you know uh, how to play Tetris and know how uh, is Tetris. So in Tetris, there is no winning state. Okay, yeah, one person do not know what is Tetris. Tetris is just a game when you have some blocks and you have to pile up these blocks uh, in, or, in order to, yeah, when you complete a line, uh, yeah, it, it's kind of difficult to explain that. Right? <laughs> uh, when you complete a line, uh, when a line in the game is completely full of blocks, this line is deleted and the objective of the game is do not lose, so, so uh, do not reach the end uh, and the top of the of the window with your block. So you stack block in a way that uh, uh, they are compact, so there is no spaces. And uh, if you complete a line, this line is removed. Uh, and so your blocks is shift down and you have more space for new blocks. Uh, but the, the important thing is that in Tetris, there is no winning state. So you, you cannot win in Tetris. You, you pile up block until you lose. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, this is, yeah. Uh, this is something that uh, uh, e e even I didn't know. I I always thought that uh, uh, you should win. In, you you could win in Tetris, but uh, I checked, I double checked, and you cannot win in Tetris. Uh, there is no winning state, so you 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 yeah. Potentially, you could continue to piling this block uh, until eternity. Uh, there is no winning state. There is no maximum maximum amount of points that you can do. Uh, it's a never, never ending game. You can only lose. If you, eventually, you will lose. Uh, so, uh, since you cannot win in this game, you can only lose. Uh, an agent, an agent, learn a very, very clever, creative, and kind of creepy behavior. Uh, because since, uh, yeah, the game cannot be won, the only way not to lose, yeah, is not to play. So the agent. Start to play quite randomly, so, so they they stack block in a very very messy and random manner, and pause the game forever before losing the game. So uh, when they almost reach the top, so yeah, the next move I lose the game. The agents pause the game forever and never resume the game. Uh, this is a yeah pretty creative behavior because no human has ever <laughs> did something like this before. But uh, yeah, I don't have any other, any other idea to uh, not losing a, a game in Tetris. So this is the only way to not lose is not to play. Pause the game. Yeah, I, I've never reached a, a nice score. I never beat the world record, but I never lose the game. And there is a YouTube video. If you are curious, you can click on it. Um, and, uh, and you see this agent. They, they start to place a block randomly, pause the game, and stays in pause forever. Uh, there is an interesting question in the chat. Uh, wouldn't one of the objectives of, of, for the agent be to maximize the score? Yes. But it turns out that uh, um, the scientists that, uh, um, uh, that developed this, uh, this system uh, put a little, uh, little advantage on maximizing score and a very big disadvantage on losing the game. Because all of the Atari NES game, for example, Pinball, for example, Pac-Man, uh, you can win, of, of course, in this game. So if you win the game, you reach a very, very, the agent um, receive a very, very high uh, reward. If you lose, the agent receive a very, very bad uh, loss. But in Tetris, you cannot win. So there is no winning state. So it, yeah, it was an error of the programmers uh, because simply you cannot win in Tetris. So you, you never reach this 
very very high score for winning the game uh so uh yeah of course if you if you program uh if you program more cleverly this agent uh this behavior uh, is discouraged is courage because the agent is more encouraged to um uh, to reach a nice score but uh, yeah it, it was it was an error of the programmers but in my opinion it uh, it turns to be a very very good error because uh this is a behavior that no i think no human has ever thought think of so just pause the game i cannot lose and uh i i've never lose a tetris game because i i didn't play any tetris game so uh it's kind of interesting behavior in my opinion uh another example this is the really really last example is the alpha go uh made by uh deep mind uh yeah i'm running out of time so i'm trying to be uh quick in this example uh in yeah this is an error it's not 20,016 it's of course 2016. uh this program uh called alpha go one against Lissidol, a time considered one of the best players at Go. Go is this uh, is this uh, Chinese, I think, game which is considered one of the most difficult game to master uh, for a human and, of course, for artificial intelligence. Uh, the most interesting things about this uh, algorithm, this AlphaGo, is that many moves uh, that will later will prove a successful moves at first seem strange and without any sense for the human it, it, there are moves that no human would have uh make in this uh, in this in um with this uh, positioning and with this with, with the with the actual board it's just yeah it seems that the wrong moves but it later this these wrong moves will prove successful uh the, the style of play of AlphaGo was not similar to the one played by humans so it's it's uh it's not uh yeah of course they uh, learn to play like humans but they surpass this level uh, learning to play in a different way so yeah i i think they have to be creative to think about another playing style uh this is a um a quote in uh, from this paper the go files ai computer Clanch victories against Go Championship by Tangui uh, Shukard, which is published in Nature. Uh, and the quote says that the algorithm seems to be holding back its power. Sometimes it plays moves that lose material because it is seeking simply to maximize its probability of reaching winning position rather than, as human players tend to do, maximize territorial gains. So many in, uh, in many moves are just no sense for humans, but turns out to be the move that uh, they uh, uh, the move that uh, the mo the most important moves uh, for uh, that uh, um, uh, that AlphaGo did do did for winning the game. Uh, so okay, some conclusion here. Uh, creativity is not a well-defined concept it is not no so this is another error here not know if it can be teach to humans or machines it uh, it not know if uh, it's a concept that uh, can be taught or it uh, kind of uh, uh, innate in our brain uh, computers can be used as a tool for creating new kinds of art music uh, uh, poetry etc but collaboration between human and computer is very tight in this field uh, so artificial intelligence can open new ways and new types of creativity uh, usually as we said in this last examples ai when it's not conditioned by, by human social priors exhibits a non-human and surprising behavior in resolving problems uh, so this think of of the box behavior would be considered creative if it were shown by a human so uh, for example, if a human did the same moves of AlphaGo, uh, it was considered a very, very creative play of style, and uh, the player probably was considered a genius of uh, of Go, a very, very good player and a very creative player. 
uh, creative AI has shown impressive results in solving problems, playing games, designing things, evolving behavior, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. A lot of things. Uh, many more conclusions. The field, the field of creative AI, is still is in infancy. There is a lot of space for exploring new ideas, uh, new directions. So if you have ideas, direction, please uh, test it. Please. Uh, uh, Test, yeah, test it and uh, develop something. Uh, there are no wrong ideas in this field. Uh, usually, the best results are the ones made by artists and scientists working together. These models are quite difficult, so the, scientist, the scientific part is uh, uh, required. But science, to, but science alone, uh, it's not enough. Uh, we need uh, help by artists. We need help by some people that work in the arts, some people that work uh, in the social behavior, some people that work in uh, another field. In my opinion, one of the most promising direction is evolutionary creativity, simply because it's not biased and, it's not, and it does not contain any preconception of humans. So it's really, really creativity. Uh, but these are some warnings. The same technology that we have seen uh, today, for example, guns, uh, cycle guns, etc., uh, can be used for malicious actions such as producing deep fakes, uh, producing fake news, uh, etc. There is also an ethical dilemma in all these technologies. Uh, for example, uh, if, I, if, if I develop a, a machine learning model, an artificial intelligence model that could write news articles, could write newspaper, could write uh, articles in general. Uh, what if the, mo the model is, bi is biased? What if the model is not fair? What if the model is uh, have some problem inside? Uh, these are some ethical questions, on, uh, some fairness questions. And if you are curious about this, there are more on this on the tomorrow morning talks by uh, our president, Martha. And I strongly encourage you to join the meeting, uh, join the talk, sorry. Uh, yeah, I leave you with uh, uh, a, yeah, a quite inspirational quote by Antoine de saint Um There is no code. Uh, I prepared the code. I share you the code for neural time transfer in, uh, uh, in the GitHub. It's, it's already on GitHub, so you can uh, download it. Uh, it's a Python, it's a Jupyter notebook, so you can download it and uh, test it on Colab. Uh, if you have any problem, please email me or uh, write me. Uh, but yeah, there is no code. Also, for another reason, these mo this models are very, very difficult to train, are very, very difficult to uh, optimize. Uh, often, they, they do not uh, output something that is appealing as the images that I show you. But the main reason is that uh, I believe that uh, if I teach you uh, how to do something, you continue to do the same thing. So there is no creativity involved in this process. So you simply continue to do the same thing that I do. Uh, the thing that uh, I, uh, yeah, I wanted to do with this talk, and I hope that uh, uh, many of you have, um, uh, have uh, uh, I, I hope that. Uh, um, I, I was able to uh, instill you some uh, curiosity and some uh, um, and some uh, uh, hype and some uh, um, I don't know uh, some uh, um, yeah curiosity for the field. So uh, I hope that many of you tomorrow they try to uh, use this model, try to produce something creative uh, because the real creativity is when uh, we did we do something new and if I teach you to do the same thing that I do there is no creativity involved so please do something new do something that is considered uh, uh, not good do something that uh, is considered uh, uh, that many people tell you that it never works because be creative and uh, do a lot of uh, <laughs> creativity, creative words, and creativity with artificial intelligence. Thank you. Uh, that's all. And uh, just 
one minute to talk about uh, AI for people. Uh, so we have a non-profit organization. Uh, we uh, are very, very happy to have organized this workshop. So thank you again to Philip, which uh, uh, was the main mind and uh, um, the most involved person in uh, the, all the organization for this workshop. We are, as I said before, a non-profit organization. And uh, we could, if you if you like uh, this workshop, if you like uh, all uh, our goals, if you like uh, our uh, our vision, you could uh, support us in many ways, like uh, uh, like us on social media. So LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, we are on almost all social media. Uh, you can talk about us. So, for example, share a post about the workshop, uh, uh, share our posts, share our initiatives, etc. You can participate in our project, in our monthly meetups. Every month we have a meetup. Uh, these meetups are open to everyone. Uh, so, for example, for, uh, for so please join our Slack channel. Uh, there are all the details. Uh, are totally free. We are very very happy to uh, welcome new people. Uh, if you want, you can also offer us a coffee or a tea. In my case, I'm more a tea guy. Uh, there is the link for donations. Uh, we appreciate. We really, really appreciate every donation. So, just one dollar, fifty cent. It's uh, it's really, really good, and a really, really, a really big thank you if you uh, if you want to donate us something. And uh, that's all. If there are some questions, I'm here to answer uh, all your questions about this or this last part and all the parts. If you have any question about all these argument, uh, uh, all these topics, please right now in the chat okay so i see there are many questions here uh okay can you share with us some sample of codes or github link yeah there is uh, uh there is a code for neural style transfer uh it's in our github so uh i think i could share the link now. Okay, it's uh, just a few minutes. Okay. These are these. Oh. This is our repository for uh, for the workshop uh in the in the folder uh, creative ai i think there is uh, uh the code for neural style transfer it runs on collab uh if you if you find any problem in running the code or if you have any question about the code please contact me my email or uh, on social network and uh, i'm uh, i will be really really happy to uh, help you or answer all your questions uh okay another question uh, the antenna case is great. Do you have example of some recent engineering achievement based on AI creativity? Uh, yeah, I have to check. Uh, now I I didn't uh, I I I don't uh, uh, yeah now I uh, yeah I have to check. But of course, if you for example if you Google some evolutionary or AI creativity, there are a lot of things. Uh, one example can be. Uh, I, I show I show you at the beginning. Uh, this chair here uh, are designed by uh, artificial intelligence, so no human is involved in the designing of this chair. Uh, so this this can also be another another example of AI creativity in design. Um, another question: uh, It's an analogy to Amazon, IBM, and Microsoft posing facial recognition development. We cannot win, so let's pose. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, this is a very interesting question. Uh, uh, well, a very delicate question. Well, I think that uh, uh, Amazon, IBM, and Microsoft pose facial recognition not because they cannot win, but mainly for ethical and for uh, uh, yeah, for ethical reason and for pressure uh, from uh, ethical association and ethical um and academia mainly uh yeah i think the facial uh, recognition can can be won can be yeah can be win eventually uh but yeah 
mm, I think that uh, the main reason is just ethical and uh, um, yeah, ethical uh, uh, and yeah, ethical problems and the pressure from um, association and uh, uh, academia. Uh, what happens if AI learns human biased biases from human made art? Art is not culturally unbiased. Yes, this is a very, very interesting question. Thank you uh, for posing it. Uh, yeah, it's true. Art is not culturally unbiased. In fact, many of the models that I show you are trained using mostly European centric art. And this is a problem. Uh, but uh, yeah, you can train your model using, for example, Asian art or Japanese art or uh, uh, African art, uh, South American art, uh, Native American art. Uh, yeah. Uh, if you want really to, um, in my opinion, if you want really to uh, build a model that learn to uh, output art that is very, very similar to human art in the, uh, in a very, very complete sense, you have to include all the kind of art that the human have ever produced. So European, uh, Asian, every epoch, every style, etc. And this is why I think that evolutionary creativity, which is uh, um, which is not based on um, real data, it's not based on uh, actual human data, it's not based on biases of human, it's not based on precon preconcepts of human, is the real key to a real creative agent because it's simply not biased or simply not uh, biased, yeah. Uh, with, the, with, with this kind of thing. So for example, train only with European art and train only with uh, Asian art, etc. cetera. Uh, is this a real quota generated with AI? So you talk about the last quote, but uh, Antoine de Chante is no, it's real. And I think it's one of my, uh, and it's one of my preferred quotes of all times. And uh, yeah, this is real, I assure. <laughs> I not generated this. Uh, another question, but uh, is AlphaGo really creative and not just really, really smart? Like a very good chess player that always has in mind many more moves ahead rather than just the current one. Uh, yes, yes, of course. Of course, there, in my opinion, there is a part of uh, just, if, just, yeah, AlphaGo has a really, really huge pow computational power. So they can see in advance many more moves than human players. But uh, many, many human players, many, many champions of Go have analyzed the style of play of AlphaGo. Uh, and they uh, end up with the, uh, with the analysis that AlphaGo play really, really different than humans. Uh, as I said before, humans tend to privilege and uh, tend to make moves to gain a territorial advantage. I don't know if you play Go. I, I do not play Go, so uh, I only read this kind of uh, this kind of things. But humans tend to uh, gain more territorial advantage. And uh, AlphaGo, on the other end, it's not concerned about territorial advantage, but it's more concerned about tactical advantage. So. Uh, especially in the middle part of the game, they do some moves that are considered kind of random or kind of the wrong moves in this for, uh, for many humans, for many champions and for many people who uh, are able to play Go. But if you, if you watch all the game, um, you see that this incorrect move uh, is just the, uh, the move that... The, uh, for example, in many, many turns later, uh, uh, shows, uh, shows all the advantages of that moves, uh, even if uh, no humans uh, have, uh, have ever played these moves. So uh, yes, there is also part of, I can see longer, I can see longer than humans, so, uh i can evaluate more strategy i could evaluate more uh, different tactics etc but there is also part of creativity because uh, alphago at the start uh 
was uh, um, l um, uh, was trained using human data, and these moves are not not are not in the in the human data are not made by human so they in some sense create some other strategies create some other way of play go create some other uh tactics uh so in my opinion this is a creative behavior i don't know if it's really creativity or it's just uh intelligence or look ahead uh, many moves but if 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 uh I consider it creative because uh, if a person uh, do the same move, it will be considered a very, very creative move. So why do not consider creative the same move uh, made by a computer? Uh, okay, there are another question. Uh, can you share with us those slides? Yes, I'll... Uh, I'll um, uh, upload the slides on the GitHub, uh, on, on the same folder that uh, uh, I link to you when there is the code. So uh, in this link, in the folder Creative AI, there is the code. I also upload the slides. Uh, I also upload the slide on SlideShare. So if you follow if you follow me on social, I share the link here. Uh, or simply, if you, if you search me on SlideShare, I'm Gabriele Graffietti, just my name and my surname. And... Uh, in few days, you can uh, you can uh, uh, you can find the slide here. Uh, last question: Clearview seems to have one facial rec recognition. I uh, I don't know Clearview. Sorry, I'm not informed, and I'm not really into facial recognition, uh, so I cannot uh, I cannot answer or um, argue. Uh, with this question. Uh, OK, I think there are no other questions. So thank you again for participating in, uh, in this talk. Thank you again for participating in the workshop. I highly encourage you to participate in all the tomorrow workshop, which I remember you are in the Monday or is Marta workshop in uh, ethical AI. In the evening, we have uh, Maurice uh, uh, talk about uh, cultural AI. Uh, after that, we have our last uh, uh, invited speaker, Shagun, from uh, Montreal Institute uh, uh, of uh, Artificial Intelligence and Facebook uh, that talk about trustworthy AI. And the last talk is uh, the Vincetto's talks about continual AI. So I actually encourage to follow all the tomorrow's talk. Uh, thank you again. If you have any more questions, please contact me in my social, email, or just... Uh, uh, enter in uh, our Slack channel and uh, send me a private message. Hope you enjoy this meeting and uh, hope you enjoy this talk. And bye-bye. Uh, See you.